Welcome to Lesson 4D, The Coriolis Effect. We're going to talk about the Coriolis Effect and how it influences plumes or air pollution. I'll do an example problem as always. So here's the Coriolis Effect. What is it? It's an apparent force that an object feels, in quotes, when moving in a rotating reference frame. So Coriolis only happens when you're in a rotating reference frame. And it's kind of a fake force, an apparent force. And we'll use a simple merry-go-round as an example. The Earth is a little more complicated. Technically, this is called a roundabout, not a merry-go-round. But if you have people standing on one of these roundabouts that just rotate around. And let's look at case one where we throw a ball from the middle of the roundabout towards the target at the outer part. This whole thing is rotating. When we're looking from the top down, it's rotating at an angular velocity omega. And uh, this is on the left is the absolute reference, reference frame and on the right is the rotating reference frame. So if you're moving with the rotating merry-go-round or roundabout. So let's think about this. What happens if you throw a ball and you throw it straight at the target? So there's another person sitting on the other end. You throw it from the middle at some speed u. And in the absolute reference frame, it's going to just go straight because you throw the object, it's just going to go straight horizontally. It'll drop with gravity, but it'll just go straight horizontally. But meanwhile, the target person at the other end has moved because you're rotating. So at time t1 he's here, time t2 he's here. So from his point of view, it seems like the ball is veering over to the right. And so if this is the view from the rotating reference frame, so again you throw the object, but because the person watching it is moving, you're going to throw it at him. But as time goes on, it'll look to him like it's going like that because he's rotating and he moves from, again, from here to here during that time between T1 and T2. And in terms of forces or accelerations, there's an apparent Coriolis force, Fc, that is to the right. And so it always veers to the right when you are in this rotating reference frame. So this Coriolis force, Fc, is what we'll call it. Coriolis force is an apparent force that veers the object to the right when omega is positive, positive in a right-hand rule kind of view. So if we have, for example, x, y, and then z in the plane coming out of the page here, that would be positive when you have counterclockwise. So it's a fake or apparent force, not really there. Kind of like centrifugal force is not really a real force. It's a fake force. The real force is called centripetal force. Okay, so let's look at what happens if we throw the ball the opposite way. So now let's look again from the top. And now the thrower is on the outside and the receiver, the target, is in the middle. So what happens here? Well, again, from the stationary absolute reference frame on the left, the thrower throws it and he seems to be throwing it at the target. But actually, since he's moving, there's a component to the left from looking from the top. So the actual velocity vector, if you take the parallelogram and sum that, he's throwing it like this. So from the absolute reference frame, it's going to go like that. From the observer's reference frame, now the observer, since he's also moving from here to here, it again appears that it's moving to his right. And so from the rotating reference frame on the right here, he th throws it at target, but because of the Coriolis effect, it veers again to the right, and there will be a apparent force, Fc, that's moving this object like the ball towards the right along the path of where he's throwing it. So you throw it at the target, but it misses, and it actually curves around. That's the Coriolis force. So we summarize this. If omega is greater than zero, counterclockwise from the top, like we're talking about, the ball veers to the right no matter what the direction of motion is. And the opposite occurs if omega is the opposite way. So I write the same statement, except now it's clockwise. Omega is less than zero. It's clockwise from the top. And then the ball veers to the left no matter what the direction of motion. Now there's some videos. If you just type in Coriolis, you'll see all kinds of videos that try to explain this. One of the best ones is this one that I have here, and I'll show you that. Coriolis effect, an object in motion appears to be deflected from its course, as if a force is pulling it sideways. To demonstrate this point, let's imagine a game of catch being played by two people on a merry-go-round that spins like the earth but is flat. Without rotation, the ball appears to follow a straight path from thrower to catcher. Imagine the ball is tossed from the center to someone at the edge. With rotation, the ball still travels in a straight line in space. 
but because the catcher is moving, the ball misses. From the vantage point of the catcher, the ball appears to curve away. The direction of apparent motion is to the right when following the path of the ball. Now the ball is thrown the other way. Because the thrower is moving, the ball has a velocity component to the right. The motion of the ball appears deflected to the right and the ball misses the catcher again. Let's look at a throw across the merry-go-round. Both people move with the merry-go-round. The ball is thrown. Although it flies straight, it appears to be deflected from its original path. Apparent deflection increases as the ball travels farther. In the southern hemisphere, rotation is clockwise when viewed from over the pole. Again, the ball follows a straight course, but its apparent flight path is diverted. This time, the effect is to divert the motion to the left. On Earth, all free-moving objects, including masses of air, are subject to the Coriolis effect. In the northern hemisphere, objects are diverted to the right, as viewed from the direction of original movement. In the southern hemisphere, the deflection is to the left. I typed up this summary statement here that I'll just read. The Coriolis force is an apparent force that a moving object feels when observed in a rotating reference frame. It's perpendicular to the direction of motion. So when this roundabout is rotating counterclockwise, the Coriolis force appears, and this is to someone in the rotating reference frame, not the stationary reference frame, it appears to pull the object to the right. So in reality, the object is actually moving in a straight line but that would be in the case of someone in a stationary reference frame, non-rotating. If you're rotating, it seems to veer to the right. Now let's do some math and equations. It turns out that the Coriolis acceleration and the Coriolis force are cross products. They're vectors with cross products as follows. Coriolis acceleration turns out to be negative two omega cross u. And then from Newton's law, fc is just mac, so you just add a mass in there. So you get this equation. Now remember back to your math class where cross products, you use the right hand rule. So the first one here just shows angular velocity vector is positive using your right hand and pointing your thumb up. In our setup with this uh, roundabout or merry-go-round, we're looking for omega cross u with a negative sign. So for any right-hand rule with a cross product, if you have two vectors, a and b, a cross b, you point your right hand, has to be your right hand, not your left hand, in a with your finger, your middle finger points b, and then your thumb points the direction of A cross B. So if we apply the right-hand rule to our roundabout, we would have the A, so let's look at the equation, omega cross U. So A is up and B is out like this. And so if you use your right-hand rule like we did here and just kind of turn it 90 degrees, Coriolis force is that way. Omega cross U is this way, but Coriolis force is the negative. There's a negative sign up here in both of these equations. So you use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction, and then you figure out the Coriolis force. And that's why when you have an object that's thrown, it will veer to the right. This Coriolis force is always perpendicular to the path of motion, and it'll always veer it to the right. Let's do a simple example with a merry-go-round or a roundabout. When I teach this in the spring, it's always right around Groundhog Day when we have this class. So Punxsutawney Phil, and there's his mass, 7.5 kilograms, is riding on a merry-go-round on Groundhog Day. Merry-go-round's radius is given. It rotates at 14.0 RPM. He's standing at the edge, as shown here. Here's Phil, and he's at R equal capital R. He's holding onto the rail to keep from flying off due to centrifugal force. Let's calculate the magnitude of the Coriolis acceleration in G's experienced by Phil. And so here's the equation for Coriolis force, and the answer is zero. There's no Coriolis force on Phil. Why is that? It's because this U in the Coriolis force or acceleration equation, that U vector, is relative. It's the relative relative speed relative to the observer. In other words, this U is relative to the observer on the roundabout, which in this case is Phil. But Phil is not moving relative to himself. He's just standing there. He didn't throw anything. He didn't throw a ball that would make it veer. From his point of view, he's just standing there. So there's no Coriolis force on Phil himself because he's not moving. It has to be an object that's moving, and that U is relative to the moving reference frame.
Part B, let's calculate the radial force in units of pound force that Phil needs to exert on the rail to keep from flying off. So this is actually a centripetal acceleration. So the acceleration, a centripetal, is towards the middle in any object that's rotating in a circle like that with some radius of curvature r. So the speed here is v, and he's moving like that. So a centripetal, and we're just doing the magnitude of it, it's towards the center, is from your high school physics v squared over r. So in this case, v is omega times r, since he's out at the edge, squared over r, or r omega squared. So f is mass times acceleration, and so we have an equation for this centripetal force, or at what Phil experiences as a centrifugal force. He feels like he's being flung to the outside. He's holding on the rail, and the rail has to be pulling him to the inside. So that's the centripetal force, which is m omega omega squared r, just plugging this in, and I plug in the mass. Omega has to be in radians per second times r, and then some unit conversion, so I get 54.4 pound force. And I want to just up here, I'll show you how I converted that from RPM to radians per second. Omega is given as 14.0 RPM, rotations per minute, and then I just multiply by 2 pi radians per rotation, 1 minute per 60 seconds, and I get 1.4661 radians per second. Radian is a non-dimensional unit, it's really just 1, so 1.4661, 1, 1 over second. So that's what I plugged in here. Now let's do the actual Coriolis force. This time in part C, Phil's angry about all the attention and he chucks a reporter's camera horizontally at 67.11 miles per hour, 30 meters per second. So we want to calculate the initial value of the magnitude of the Coriolis acceleration on the camera in Gs. We'll look at acceleration, not force here. So let me write down the acceleration, AC, and we're going to look at the magnitude of it. So AC magnitude is negative 2 omega cross u, but we're talking about the magnitude. So this just turns out to be negative 2 omega times u. Since u and omega are perpendicular to each other, omega is up on this roundabout and u is horizontal. So since they're 90 degrees apart from each other, you don't need any kind of sign in that cross product. So it's just simply negative 2 omega u. So that's all we have to calculate. And in terms of g's, we want the AC magnitude divided by g to give you the number of g's. So this would simply be 2, and I'm not worried about the sign. Just take away this negative sign here and put this magnitude there, since it's the magnitude of the whole thing. So we have just 2 omega u over g. And when I plug in the numbers, I get 8.97 g's. And that's, that's a lot, almost 9 g's. So the acceleration on this camera is going to be about nine times the acceleration of gravity. And of course, it will veer to the right. So if Phil throws this camera at a person, it's not going to hit the person. It's going to veer to the right just as the ball veered to the right. And I'll make a final uh, comment on here. Do not confuse Coriolis force with centripetal force, or you might call it centrifugal force. On the Earth, the Earth is a sphere, not just a flat roundabout, but the Coriolis situation is very similar. The same principles apply. you got to use a right-hand rule. Now you have some signs involved, though, because you're not always perpendicular. But it turns out that no matter where you are in the northern hemisphere, any particles that are moving in any direction will veer always to the right relative to the person moving with the Earth, which all of us are moving with the Earth. So this includes the wind, and that sets up some wind patterns that are interesting. And then the same thing happens in the southern hemisphere, except we're veering to the left always, no matter what direction you're starting from. So it's different in the northern and southern hemisphere. And I summarize this here. Objects in the northern hemisphere veer to the right clockwise due to Coriolis. In the southern hemisphere, they veer to the left counterclockwise. And this includes any objects removing relative to the Earth, surface, balls, airplanes, bullets, even parcels of air itself or wind, as in the above sketch. And that's why we're dealing with this because this affects how plumes move around and how air pollution moves around on the earth. There's all these complicated patterns that come up called Hadley cells. I just want to mention bullets briefly. It turns out that Coriolis force is very significant in bullets because they travel so fast. Remember, capital U is the speed, and that is part of your Coriolis acceleration and force. So bullets experience a very large Coriolis force, so much so that marksmen have to correct for it. And so in the northern 
hemisphere they're shooting at a target if they line up their sights they'll always hit to the right of the target so they need to adjust for that because of Coriolis well this leads to some significant global wind patterns as I said and I'm not going to get into all the details but these are called Hadley cells these Hadley cells form and there's grouping of these so that you get this circulation hot air near the equator rises and that causes this kind of convection cell here then it goes the opposite here there's three of those rings in the northern hemisphere and the opposite in the southern hemisphere and then you also have Coriolis effects going on so when the air is moving towards let's look at where we live up here in this part of the world and the air is predominantly moving upward but it's also going to veer to the right so we call this the prevailing westerlies so where we live the wind tends to move from the south to the northeast kind of like that we call that the westerlies and then there's trade winds and southern trade winds etc now all these Hadley cells these are these convection cells so it gets very complicated here's another picture of it the westerly winds and it with the United States superimposed so in Pennsylvania we're like right here and that's what we predominantly see the EPA put some tracers in a plume in Florida and it kind of has that same veering effect because of the Coriolis force from Georgia it goes up here to Pennsylvania from Florida it ends up in Washington DC area and that's actually more westerly up here so that's a result of these patterns and then finally a couple years ago you may have remembered we had some very very cold days in the winter and they blamed it on something called a polar vortex well what that was we have all these Hadley cells and everything but sometimes they can get unstable and have this kind of wavy shape and that was what was causing the cold air to blow down and into our neck of the woods and make us very cold for a while so that's a little bit about the Coriolis Force. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.